Hi, I'm Graham Blackburn, and this is Traditional Woodworking by Hand. And today's episode is probably the most important part of woodworking you'll ever learn. In previous episodes, we've talked a little bit about sharpening. Today, we're gonna to be talking about sharpening using a jig, which I don't always do, but more importantly, we're gonna be having an introduction into Japanese water stones. I'm gonna be using to demonstrate one of my favorite planes. This is a Norris smoothing plane. And as I've said before, one of the most important things about any plane, whether it's wooden, whether it's a brand new standy plane, whether it's something made in between, is that the sole has to be flat because you can't plane anything flatter than the flatness of the sole itself. So the very first thing that you should do if you're using a metal plane, whether it's an expensive Norris plane, whether it's a Lee Nielsen plane, whether it's a Stanley plane or any other kind of plane, is to make sure the sole is flat. Here's how you do that. This is a piece of 100 grit wet or dry paper that I've spray glued onto a piece of plate glass. And if I lap the sole of the plane on this flat surface, as soon as I can see scratches left by this wet or dry paper across the entire sole, as you can see here, then I know that the sole is flat. That's number one. Now, the next thing that we're going to be doing that doesn't have to do directly with the stones is the use of a jig. In the past, I've talked about the benefits of sharpening by hand without a jig, but today we're going to be using one of the many different kinds of jigs you can get that are designed to guarantee that the angle of the bevel that we make when we're sharpening remains the same. So I've set this jig up, I remove the little guide, and I now have a jig, which when I put it on a stone, it will be at exactly the right angle. So let's get to the water stones. Water stones are called water stones because they need to be soaked in water. There are lots and lots of them. There are manufactured water stones that you see here and then over here in my sharpening stone case, I have a few natural water stones. These also have different qualities and will probably be the subject of a future episode. But today, we're just going to use three of the inexpensive King water stones. And we'll start off with a stone that's a thousand grit. Like pretty much all stones, the most important thing is that the stone itself has to be flat. Because in the same way that you can't plane anything flatter than the flatness of the plane, you can't sharpen anything flatter than the flatness of the stone. So having had this stone in water for a while so that it's completely soaked, the first thing that I need to do is to lap it just like I lapped the sole of the plane to make sure that the stone itself is perfectly flat. Then, taking the iron in its jig, I can put it carefully on the stone and I can move this backwards and forwards and I do it, as you can see already faintly, that metal is being worn off, you can, beginning, you can begin to see blackness of the metal coming off. And I do this until I do two things, until I have now scratched the surface of the bevel 
with scratches all the way across made by this stone and until I can see the blackness on the stone here and also something that you shouldn't actually test I would have raised a burr on the back of this stone here resist the temptation of trying to feel the burr because if you do you may very well break off the minute particles of metal that form the burr and then you'll be left with a minute blunt edge it's much better to put this iron on the flat stone and wear whatever burr you have off and once again if you look closely you can see the blackness from the back of the stone right now you do that until in the same way that you check the flatness of the sole of the plane that you can see the marks left by the grit whatever coarseness it was of the stone on both the back of the blade and on the front of the blade the moment you can see that it's time to move up to a finer stone there are lots of different stones we're just using these manufactured red water stones but if you like this and you get into this more you might find you might use natural stones but that's the subject for, as I said before for another episode so now we're going to move from what was a thousand grit stone to a 1200 grit stone I'm going to do the same thing first thing is to make sure double check that the stone itself is perfectly flat and then putting it on my shooting board carefully putting the jig back on the stone and being very careful not to press too hard I'm going to do the same thing until the scratches left by this stone have all completely replaced the scratches left by the previous stone and I'm going to do that both on the front and the back but before I turn over because this iron is going in my smoothing plane where no matter how thick a shaving I set the plane to take I want the edges of the shaving to disappear into nothing so that when I feel the wood where I've taken a shaving I can feel the edge of the shaving I move my fingers from the center to one side and take a few strokes just pressing very lightly on this side and then I take a few strokes with my fingers pressing lightly on the other side and you can see the metal coming off now I know from experience that that's enough to have created a crown here but the crown is so slight since I'm only going to be taking a shaving that's maybe a thousandth of an inch thick that I defy anybody to look along the edge of the blade and see that it's actually a crown but you'll see when we use it that in fact it does make a shaving that disappears from one side to the other having done that it's now important to turn it over and as before wear off any burr that might have been caused by sharpening the front of the iron right now we move on to the last stone we'll put this back in the Part here and now I'm taking out a finished stone. Finished stones come in a large variety and they're a lot harder. The grain of the stone, the grit of the stone is much finer. So when you use these stones they make even finer scratches usually so fine that you can't even see them. In order to make a bit of a paste for this, so that it has a bite, I'm going to use something called a Nagura stone. And this, in effect, is an even harder piece of stone, a finished stone. And by rubbing this on the finished stone, it will start to create 
a certain amount of small, almost invisible paste that will help cut the surface of the blade here. Now, if you look closely, you can see that this is like a lot of old wooden planes. This is an iron that's made out of two pieces of metal. At the edge, it's really shiny because that's really hard steel and that's been laminated onto a softer piece of steel. So now, making sure that this is nicely lubricated, I do exactly the same thing. And you can see right away that by my holding the jig right on the center, that the metal that's being worn off is from the center. That's another indication that I did in fact make a crown there. So I'll do that until I'm, I've removed all the scratches left from the previous stone. And then I'll move my fingers over to one side. Now you can see metal being moved off from that side. And then I'll move my fingers to the other side. And you can see metal being removed off that side. This is how I form the crown. And then maybe cleaning the stone a little bit. I now turn the iron over and wear off any burr that may have been made. And once again, you can see the blackness that's being worn off. Now, I inspect this, and if you look closely, you can see how shiny, how very perfectly shiny the very edge is. You almost can't see the scratches. Nevertheless, I should point out, as a matter of interest, that metal, just like the stones, is a composite material. That means that there's not much point in using a stone that leaves scratches that are smaller than the particles that make up the actual iron itself. There are, however, a couple more things that I need to do before I can put the iron back in the plane. The first thing that I need to do is to make sure that the cap iron is also perfectly fitted. So holding the cap iron so that it's at least a little lower than the flatness of the stone. I take a little metal off that, it never really gets worn, but what that does is to guarantee that the very edge of the cap iron is going to fit perfectly on the back of the iron here. So, loosening the jig and carefully removing the blade, I have one last thing to do, which is to lap the iron on both sides on the heel of my hand. Now, at this stage of the game, the iron is very, very sharp. And unless fate is not smiling on me, I have never yet cut myself doing this. But what that does is to minutely wear off any little burr that there might possibly be. And I can kind of do the same thing here. Now, before I reassemble things, I have one other little secret, which is to use a little camellia oil. Camellia oil has two wonderful properties. First of all, it's a very, very fine oil. So I squirt a little bit onto the back of the blade. And by doing this, it'll do two things. The oil, believe it or not, will fill up any scratches, which I defy you to be able to see, left by the stone. And it will also guarantee that none of this, if you're in a very damp location, actually gets rusty. So now we're ready to reassemble the cap iron onto the iron itself. I do that carefully by putting the nut into the hole, holding this the cap iron up so it doesn't touch. I turn it around until it gets onto the iron and I move it down close to the edge so that it's no further from the edge of the cutting iron 
than the thickness of the shaving that I want to take. At this stage of the game, you might possibly be able to see that there is in fact a small crown. So now, carefully tightening this, you can put the iron and the cap iron back in the plane, carefully. My nice Norris plane, goes all the way in, fits in the little hole here. There it is, and I tighten this. And then I should be ready to take some shavings. Here is a piece of really curly maple. It's called curly maple because the grain is going every which way. And if anybody ever told you to get a smooth surface, you must always plane with the grain. What on earth are you gonna do when the grain comes in a different direction in every way? What a lot of people do is to simply get out their sand or sand it. But sanding by definition just abrades the surface and prevents the light from penetrating the wood and being reflected back at all these different angles that gives you such a wonderful surface. So let's see, put the plane on the iron, put the plane on the wood I mean, and nothing happens. So loosen this a little bit, give it a little turn, still not deep enough. Still not deep enough. Still not deep enough. So as you can see, I'm planing with the plane held at a bit of an angle. And regardless of where the grain is, I'm taking shavings with no tear out. And if we look at one of these shavings, we can see, I'll find my shaving here, that no matter how thick it is in the middle, it disappears to nothing at either side. That way, I can run my finger across the board and I can't feel where any of the shaving was. And it didn't matter whether I was planing in this direction or whether I was planing in this direction, backwards or sideways or whatever. So that's how you use water stones in order to get a plane sharp enough to be able to plane in any direction without getting tear out. I hope you like that. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button and by all means, send me comments and questions. And next time we'll go on to something even more interesting.